I mean, there's a lot of games I can play on. I mean, this is like five years I old. I get um, the, the uh, yeah. updates yeah. almost every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's no way I can. Machine learning people. Like, like they have a nice first pop up over the trouble, like, right? Like, like, yeah. yeah. Skins and so it's you got nothing that gives you the encourage the, the uh, right. fun stuff. Yeah, training so skills and all these like, separate validations. Uh, I've watched a lot of streamers that have played other games. Well, you know, uh, Ubuntu, this, this, this 20 year old kid, 17, called the EMB. You have to buy that uh, $60. I used to run the Blue Tree as my primary and my laptop. Yeah, so until some card that would An update just stopped uh, working uh, uh, altogether. I think it was useful. But Fedora came up perfectly. And then there was a bunch of people I'm running my grand Fedora. That was an older laptop. Do I think it was Game Cube emulation? I'm called on PC. Yes. Well, well apparently the, the, the graphics chip on it is programmable. You basically give it, I think, something it's along the lines that they didn't ask to say take okay. input from Rather these. Than being through this set of it, it, okay. it's sort of so slightly programmable. That may be what I'll be working. And the problem is, is, in order to I've been very happy emulate it in OpenGL, you have to generate a new shader program. So and so and and, and, I and the problem is, is that you can change it in very, very, very quickly on the actual hardware. KDE when I was so you couldn't system. really emulate it in but real time. Uh, you had to basically rebuild the shader program every time this thing changed. Basically on the same page. Sure. And then what? Uh, and more recently, so what they did was they tried Linux. getting ba basically emulating the Nintendo software. graphics yeah. hardware I in really the shader like program. And the higher end graphics yeah. chips yeah. are in yeah. fact yeah. fast yeah. enough to Which like emulate um, a GameCube hardware in pretty close to real time. Oh yeah. And just kind of like still are. I saw that one coming. Well, did you know that the Super Game Boy, or the, the Super Nintendo, had all uh, these, uh, the mm -hmm. all, all the, uh, the, the Game Boy the support of the Go and stuff? The, because the Super Nintendo didn't Strange have the uh, back 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 Everybody's yeah. got the yeah. Game Boy preferences. Yeah. 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 Full-fledged okay. relaunch of the full well because it's 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 coming next summer. Oh, I suspect that will be a pretty but good thing. If anything actually I comes out of the like Intel you know, management mm -hmm. thing, oh it's boy, there is going to be oh, it's going to be an interesting talk at Black Hat. So yeah, if if they are actually doing what they say they are. And some of the evidence that they really probably are I just coming like back to the scene. The so what are, what are they saying? Um, it's going to be and it's um, got a lot of enhancements that you can make. It sounds a little in the dark. Yeah. It's yeah. Not, for instance, yeah. I like it the way I like have basically a, any I have my favorites up here. Yep. Processor. The, I think they were, they were targeting course. Skylake in later. Yeah. <laughs> It's very possible that you get into earlier. I'm, 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 not sure, the I'm not sure what dates of the Intel generation yeah. chip it's generation. A don't plug in. Yep. But any of those, I they, have they will to be able to, to basically. Primarily they're, they're saying you can do it via USB. I mean, imagine it's very potentially possible that you will be able to get all of them experiment the uh, network when they're off as well. I feel but, uh, mm -hmm. it's not really but I'm not a what? Yeah. distro yeah. hopper. I've um, and four or five basically different It's and very like possible that for there are a lot of reasons. unpleasant things you can do to but machines within the whole processor. KDE for what I do most um, of the time. Because of a couple country. of little programs so that are part of their normal uh, system. Well, uh, and no, and then like beyond that, it doesn't really well, matter no, anyway, it because was you can load anything from so any of the for like, yeah, this Lenovo clusters. Security. Just that if you're going to use KDE, like you get all the Lenovo cute stuff. Like yeah. now they're like specializing in like and that makes it a little crowded in some sense, although with a terabyte of 
storage and now the problem is, is that or AMD this, also this has a somewhat has similar sort of 16 thing. Gigs they of haven't RAM. been targeting that because AMD is not quite as yeah. large of a market. Right. Um, but they've got right. basically right. similar yeah. thing. Um, the, the question is what's going to happen. Right? Are, are a whole bunch and of machines get BIOS updates so that you can do completely something. disable this? Can I go back or to are you screwed? Have you got hardware? Can I go back to mainframes? What, what is it, the situation? What is that? Just what the attacker do? Um, well, it's basically you're breaking into a hypervisor on the processor. Okay. My favorite story from that time period was that I was at the University taking some graduate courses. Signed up for a Fortran course. Okay. Okay. And you can control the execution. Which was you know, running. This is the way of running terminals in one room. It's not like people are going to like, and then you walk down the hall. Uh, well, like denial of service. Run well, if, through the sorter to make at, sure that they were what you wanted the for your stack. Of the okay. system, what you can do is add well, the stacks first of all, to the tech. You can add yourself and to the flash here. Five minutes doing at which point, it was very difficult for me. Now go back to those days um, where we had people on our own cards. Look at all of the raw memory if you so desire. At which point you can basket. probably mm -hmm. guess what OS is running. We have the largest and then you can and if you largest non got and, and if you've got the right tool, you can probably start saying, oh, okay, this is running Linux. Ah, oh, here's a web browser <laughs> process. <laughs> Here, let's main frame is um, start stealing mm -hmm. credit card numbers or other things or just similar things no, may be possible on Windows. Hey, you want to start passing that around? So it will be stealing credit cards when you guys are breaking into a hypervisor that Intel happily provided and wasn't uh, a big deal about it except for uh, large company IT. I didn't like the delays, so after that one course, decided that I look into buying a personal computer because there was the time when they were coming out, 76, 77, so, okay. 78. And I yeah. invested in a TRS-80. So, so far we haven't uh, seen the proof, and was but able to spend what is being claimed is plausible. Five or six hours after school. Well, it looks like that. Uh, with no delay between seeing what was on the screen and what was going I started to have a special load. Much that, better. Uh, Much better. Yeah, why loads I started on the mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, Because they don't want to be near. I started at 65. And then yeah. Fought a war for a while um, and then came back. Yeah. And worked for a couple of the bank. And the question is. Yeah. is Will and Burger King is the first start getting for online terminals. Mm -hmm. Well, ultimately the question is, will it be possible to purchase yeah. systems that have that capability either removed or public? I was being the law. He's in charge. Pretty much every oh, I'm just curious, like yeah, a 3D printing, do you have any education of the like a formatic code? And that's, that's a problem. There are, that's but kind of not at my level. I'm a uh, combine that with USB oh, to give the DMA. Oh, base yeah. level yeah. concepts, maybe. Oh, uh, USB, yes. So you are not going to uh, have to At least originally was yeah. not supposed to have. I don't have the skill. Ever. I'm not right. at that level by any means. Not uh, supposed. I got this as a yeah. prize, believe it or not. Okay. So how much the cost mm -hmm. right now? That one right there, the Bald Spot Mini, is twelve hundred and fifty dollars. Twelve hundred. Twelve hundred. One thousand two hundred and fifty. How much the material? I know that has several different kinds. Right. The PLA, which is what I use all the time, is a kilogram for about twenty-five dollars. It's a real. Yeah. 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 We had a similar system at work here. Oh, right. well, Lulzbot well, actually scared us way free. Mm. Well, we set it up in a lab at work. 
Technically, it's vegetable. Pretty aside pretty okay. from the show and tell, if you just want to go to that address, you'll be able to see this. <laughs> so, uh, when you start, I'm going to turn uh, these, light, these lights, lights off. Okay. Because it's basically hard to the screen. You can't dim the lights anymore. Anyway. We used to be able to turn these off. What? So we just turn these off. Dimmer doesn't work in this room anymore? Yeah. 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 It doesn't work any of these rooms anymore. It works in the little one. It says Octopus. It must be an upgrade mm -hmm. gone wrong. Yeah. Apparently, you you lose dimmer functionality to get HDMI. Just dimmer still work anymore. Fundamental information. So and I'll talk and more than there are words on the page. Clearly. Oh, okay. All trade offs all the way down. Yeah, because I'm working with the one hospital in mm -hmm. China right now. Well, they are getting like. Uh, Print, I guess, on human body. My understanding is that there are tissue printers oh, that, that are that functionally working okay, now. So oh, that that yeah. Because that's a relatively simple material to try to print. The difficulty has come when trying to integrate different cell types because of the number of materials that need to be printed, but they've done ears for cartilage and for the skin, printing the whole ear. It's not done with this FFF method because the materials don't squeeze through a uh, pointer quite the same way, uh, but okay. there are laser techniques uh, that can uh, fuse either by laser light or by ultraviolet or by uh, other methods. Mm -hmm. They have I, baths I, of fluid out of which they lift objects, uh, making layers on the bottom rather than Another building day, them up on the top, account. which is what right. I do. <laughs> there are some video, yeah. videos yeah. online yeah. of the process. And, and I forget what it's called, called right but it's a yeah. and then what additive. The, uh, the guy behind the, the, and the right fluid guy. gets yeah. shined on by various kinds of light, huh. yeah. and which sure pulls the material, the material together to make an object. I would think that a tissue <laughs> printer would have to be hand built at these times. That most of the software is designed for uh, circuitry that is in experimental phase rather than in production phase. That's a good question. STL being, being the layering tool that considers where to deposit or skip on in the plastic. And so maybe it might be STL, but there are apparently a half dozen formats that are possibility. I would say look up the tissue and 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 tissue Printers variously are made with single extruders, 
to make one stream of plastic in my case, or two or even three extruders, which means the materials come in at the appropriate time when this one gets over the right spot, it squirts, and then that one gets in there, it squirts. And you might have a printer that had four or five extruders, each one being controlled by a more complicated software. So that's kind of much more and this one is a relatively small I mean, printer, the only thing I like to do box so about that big, uh, uh, square tube, with a relatively <coughs> small <coughs> limit on the size. Or a story or something. Or no, you take a statement from like either a uh, neo-Nazi oh, form. Where are there small sizes? Uh, in a way, for those of you that's the height uh, and approximately the same width. We're width. probably not going to go to the Cambridge Brewery anymore. We just put the meeting too late. They closed their kitchen. So we wouldn't be able to get there in I might as well start in, in too. Okay. Let them know that I did show up. I still have it in my announcement. I got it. Thank you. You're welcome. I recycled the announcements. I forget to go to the bottom and change a couple of things. Yeah. So the essentially you take a, 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 a headline or something from either, from either a neo Nazi website or a Humboldt blog or something and remove all references to race, gender, uh, or ethnicity or whatever, and you try to guess whether it's a question answer whether it's you know a neo Nazi or a or a you want to come with. Uh, so any questions? Hopefully that Linux will uh, I actually have one. So um, one of my frustrations is you know I do lots of presentations. And I find it's really impossible to get a PowerPoint to look like it does <coughs> under Adobe PowerPoint under Linux. And it's probably due to fonts. I don't know. Probably. But you know, if I use LibreOffice or uh, I even tried using like Google Sheet, uh, yeah, it just rendered everything. Wrong. Yeah. Uh, if you want PDFs to look. Right. Oh, you you have that. to use the uh, MS. No. Well, installing the MS fonts and using the MS fonts would help. But for uh, professional results with making a PDF, oh, you have to go into the settings and save it as a uh, archive mode PDF, and that would cause it. But the necessary portions of fonts in it so that it's portable. So I, I was talking about PowerPoint, not PDF. I'm sorry, you, 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 you said PDF in there at some point, I thought. I meant to say PowerPoint. Um, oh, you well, said Adobe in there. Well, <laughs> yeah. Microsoft. If, 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 you, if you. So Microsoft built PowerPoint. Yeah, okay, so, okay, so yeah. yeah, PowerPoint that. The when you're displaying PowerPoint, you need the same fonts as made with, uh, or you need to save it to an archive PDF and show that instead. Yeah. So I thought the first uh, yeah, uh, you, you, PowerPoints you, you, are portable only if you make them in Helvetica. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, the original. I'm unfortunately not kidding. Yes. Uh, and, of course, and of course, the original. And of course, you think PDF and that first letter was supposed to be. Portable. And, and, yeah, so my and, and if your service bureau has the fonts that you need them uh, to use to print your PDF, you don't need to use archive mode. You just make sure your service bureau has the right fonts. If everybody in the company has the right font, you don't need to use archive mode. But if you're sending it to a way far away server, which is going to hold it for 40 years, and you want people to be able to do it in 40 years, or you're sending it to the other side of the internet to somebody whose computer is set up different than yours, mm -hmm. um, like maybe they're using micro Microsoft or Adobe instead of LibreOffice, um, and they have the Macintosh fonts instead of uh, the Linux fonts, mm -hmm. uh, which Linux fonts were question. Um, <coughs> then you've got to use archive mode or it's not going to work. 
So I see TTF MS core fonts installed, is that what you're talking about? That is not what I'm talking about, that's what he mentioned, which is helpful for making something that's going to be viewed by Windowsy people because then you can choose to use Windowsy fonts. So my, my goal is I want to set up my computer to present PowerPoints. Somebody walks over with their beautifully done PowerPoint on a thumb drive and I plug it into my computer. If you get a PowerPoint that you're not the author of and you want to display, yes, you want to install MS Core Fonts. Okay. If you haven't installed MS Core Fonts yet, well, I'll invite it a lot. George and Verdana are two of the nicest free fonts in the world. Why would you not want to install it? Okay, here's one. Uh, here's one. If you're offended by someone saying X, it's a good indication that you are in X. And so, what does that sound like? If, if you're offended by someone saying X, it's a good indicator that it's a, it's a, it's a good indicator that you are a, you're, or you're in X. Let's see. Is okay. Let's see. Uh, you how much more offensive is it would be if you uh, if you're saying X11. Uh, it's Seth Rogen. Okay. Go figure. Well, that one can be used a couple of different ways. Yeah. Well, he said um, he said if you were essentially he said if you're offended by someone saying cracker, it's a good indicator. It's a good indicator that you're a cracker. Um. But one half would have to be somewhat sensitive uh, to the cracker rate without being a cracker. Although, I, mean, I, I thought crackers were proud of being crackers. My redneck relatives are happy to call uh, them. Yeah, and then you got those, uh, the, what is it, the, the uh, four channers posting those uh, posters uh, for in places, you know, saying it's okay to be white. No, we're past yeah, eight o'clock. Uh, we're, we're a couple minutes past eight o'clock. Yeah, I'll wait for another five minutes and that statement is that it takes off. It looks like this is all we're going to get tonight. Yeah. Nancy said she'd be here before seven thirty, and she hasn't shown. So. Can I post the question to the mailing list asking them how many people have stopped attending because of the parking. Okay. So you guys here? Uh, you guys try out the new version of Firefox yet? I want to. I'm having a conversion. New as of when? Uh, like the other day. I think it was either yesterday or the day before. Mm -hmm. It's official. 57. Uh, I actually use Firefox and Chrome for different things right. at the same time. Mm -hmm. For the different identities. Right. Um, and, and Running two monstrous brand new browsers is a real problem. Let's see what I have. But yeah, it comes down the way where I mean, you can set up the traction uh, plan. Uh, that's or just I'll just go up there and start you. Was that just released on the Mozilla site yesterday, or is that already in like a DM no update? Real uh, is yeah, that I did a DNF update last night, so. Um, if it was already in the repos for well, our 26. If you're on, um, if you're on 26, uh, it's the idea that this is a. Well, but if you're, if you're on 26, driver, you can move this with your finger and all. Right well, now that I think of it, I didn't screen. restart Firefox yep. after the update. Yeah. Interesting. So even if it did install, I was probably still running the older one. Yeah. Yeah. What would happen if two African countries got so in the war? So the screen controls up here. Third World War. Two what countries? I can do African countries. A lot of dead people. Mm -hmm. had several, uh, third world war. It had several in the last 15 years that didn't happen. So the screen is live oh, as well. That's it's live. Third world country, so oh, you can't. Third no, world you war. can't scroll it. There's a big difference between a fight between two countries you know, and a world war. Third world doesn't actually. Uh, no, this is just not touching it. This is this is just a display of what you have. You've got that display. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 See, the way it works is, is the first uh, world, Earth, the second world, Mars, and the third world, I guess, would be okay. Venus. Well, no, first world yeah. were people that... Uh, I usually set it up that, a little uh, bit ahead of time. ...aligned with the mm -hmm. allies, 
and the second world was people who were well pro the axis. So hmm? no, oh, Soviet the Union. South block. Yeah, it turned out. <coughs> And then third world is people that who, who were allied with the Nazis for a couple of weeks. Well, yeah. As it turns out, the the, um, the the hilarious thing was the way the um, communists infiltrated unions in America and England, um, were sabotaging the war efforts. Facebook ads. Yeah, yeah. It's not their. This isn't their first time. <laughs> Interfering in our internal politics? Oh no, I was talking about there. There were documents that, that the, recently in the release that, as it turns out, the Soviets offered to stop, um, offered to you know fight with the with America to stop Hitler, but they didn't either didn't respond or whatever. So they so then uh, you know as history showed, they you know probably joined up with Germany and to, to split Poland. But uh, America wasn't even in the war then. Yeah. Um, the, um, we didn't get in the war until 41. Right. Very late 41. Yeah, December 41. Oh, December 7. That's correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The, the, uh, the day of infamy. Yeah. Are we ready to start? Yes. Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay, I'd like to introduce Algot Ruman. Algot's going to be talking about 3D printing. And uh, he's going to show himself in 3D on the screen. I'll do that here. Incredible <laughs> <laughs> simulation. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, part of this presentation will be like kindergarten show and tell. <laughs> we'll have a couple of bags of things that I brought along which have occupied my time for the past almost a year. I started 3D printing in December 2016 when I was fortunate enough to do a tweet that entered me into a contest run primarily by the Open Source Way people, which is a Red Hat company. Opensource.com officially is their website. The only stipulation was that after I got the machine, I'd see whether I could write up an article, which I did. And there's a link to the article at the bottom of this particular page. I had never used a 3D printer, although I had visited a makerspace where making is the thing of the day. Now I'll pass this one around first because it's the first project. You're welcome to reach in and pull out one to look at. That's a chess <coughs> set. It wasn't the first project I did. First project I did was a key fob because it was flat. <laughs> it didn't take a lot of material or time to make. I could get a key fob out of the printer in about 13 minutes. I was able to figure out how to put text on the flat surface, which turned out to be much easier than I expected, because there is, in the software I choose to use, a built-in set of font controls. It will automatically print in liberation sans, which is built into the software but you're welcome to choose any of the fonts that you can put on your system, which is a nice fact of the software because some of the fonts that you want to work with aren't common, so you wouldn't find them on a normal machine. One of the most recent projects I did was, again, a flat project, as it turned out. A bookmark. The bookmark has a person's name on it or a couple of different lines if you want to make more than one. The problem with doing letters is that either you erase them, making the bookmark a little difficult to fit in between pages, 
or you slice them out of the plastic. And that means letters like O are just a big circle and don't really look too good. So in that particular case, I was forced into finding, which wasn't difficult because there are a lot of available free fonts online, finding a uh, stencil font that looked good enough, was easy enough to read, but because of the crisscross parts of a stencil font, the O gets attached usually at the top and bottom of the O, and there's a center. So you can write Bob, and it doesn't look like B, balloon, B. And as a matter of fact, the B <coughs> don't look good if you use a routine font either, because when you try to pick up the plastic off the heated bed, once it's cooled down, B's are empty, O's are empty. So those are among the design issues that you do need to face. So you can't do it by having uh, two different colored plastic? You probably could, but this printer is a one extruder ah, okay. machine. It's the least expensive model that is complete and not a kit. Most of the models that are out there that you can buy for somewhere above $200 are kit models which you put together carefully lining everything up and then making sure that every piece is tight and then making sure that the parts fit with the software you've decided to run. A good thing for a maker who's ready to start at ground zero, but not a good thing for a person like me who wants to be a maker, but has more experience with a little bit of code background and absolutely none with making something like this. These are steel. The greenish plastic is plastic that was actually manufactured by Lulzbot using Lulzbot 3D printers. These are not standard extrusion parts that you would buy like a, a fork or a spoon. Those plastic extrusion parts are done similarly, but by squeezing plastic into a mold, letting it cool and then breaking away the little tabs like the old car models and boat models and plane models. That's great. And a final version of a lot of what gets done with 3D printers these days are converted to that sort of thing for final production because it's a heck of a lot cheaper to make 50 molds, squeeze a lot of plastic into 50 molds, and you've got 50 in about a minute and a half, you're done. Big production company, you can put 1,000 every second. So. This is prototyping equipment for most users. For a hobbyist like me, it's really a mix. I can prototype, and one of the things that I wound up doing fairly early, it turned out to be my primary, got a lot of show and tell here, my primary glory was the handle for a Black and Decker Workmate. Mine broke 25 years ago. I banged the Workmate against the wall and the plastic snapped off. I'd been turning it like this, or with a wrench, for 20 years. So when I got this, Dawn came to me and said, all right, if you're good enough, you can actually manufacture a replacement. There is one of these on my workmate at the moment. This has a handle that works just like the original. This was not printed as a single piece. This was printed as two. The spinning handle and the crank handle itself. But as I say, it's totally possible to be completely practical with what you do. If you 
you are an engineer and you have design plans that you want to execute, come up with a good design, build the pieces together using a solid CAD kind of software, which is the type I'm using, Open S-C-A-D, Open S CAD is how that's pronounced, or Open Solid CAD. There's a very expensive equivalent known as SolidWorks. Engineers use SolidWorks. I'm not an engineer. I'm an obvious. I use a free book. Okay. So where does that leave us? As far as this, I don't know why. The process is the next <coughs> issue. When you want to make something, you put some plastic that comes on big reels or small reels. Big reels are less expensive for the plastic. You hang the reel on the top of this particular printer, although some designs have it come up and over. It doesn't really matter, except that this is like a waterfall, and the plastic has no resistance against going through the control. On the ones that feed from the bottom, I would imagine you need to make sure every once in a while that it isn't tightening up, jamming somehow, because that would make your flow thinner than it should be. And you get a lousy layer. What happens is, if you look at any of those uh, small parts, the layers form one on top of the other. This printed that way. I'm sure some of you have heard of money clips. This was my most recent real practical project. This has been in use since July. It hasn't worn out. It gets pulled off the money every day usually only once. I don't buy a lot. But this had to be printed that way because it's really difficult to get a curve with layers that are being built up one on top of another this way without having some of those pieces of plastic squeezed drooping. And they can droop badly. So that is what you have to think about when you are fusing one layer on top of the other. It's not just make a shape and push it through. You've got to think design-wise what angles can work, what angles cannot, how far can you push it before it becomes a real problem, because a couple of drooped filaments, you can cut them away. It's not a big issue. But if the drooped filaments are 40, looks like hair hanging down, and you've got to cut it away, and you've got a sloppy looking interior where the layers were skipped. So that is what fused filament uh, fabrication means. Filament fuses as you go, and you got to think ahead. All right. <coughs> With that in mind, it is possible to do some funny twists. This is actually just an experimental twist of a rectangle. Done with reductions in size. That was not my design. Which brings me to discussing how to make something. You either design it yourself or you go to a place where people have already posted designs and download a file that can go to your printer. Fortunately, there's a format known as stereolithograph or STL that is one of the file formats that's in common use all around the system of 3D printing. And everybody who does 
3D printing is ready to pass along the STL files. There's a uh, place on the web known as Thingiverse. Thingiverse. It's a link at the bottom of this page. And if you go to Thingiverse, you will find hundreds of thousands of designs ready to just pull over to your printer. Off you go, you don't have to design a thing. But if you want to design something, that's the fun in my mind. This is a salt shaker, which I hope is empty. <laughs> it's also too big. Now, I use open SCAD. You, you worry if you take that around, you'll be assaulted? Ah, yes. Pepper me with questions, please. In what way is it too big? In what way is what? The, in what way is the salt shaker too big? The hole's too oh, big? The, or no, the, the, the reservoir? shaker itself is too big for a standard looking on the table version. This was a first big size run, and I said, oh. This ought to, and then it's too big to put on the table for most people. Yeah, so I did a smaller one, which everybody was happy with. Given that I've lived with a couple of Star Trek salt vampires, I'm not sure there's such a thing as too big a salt shaker. Okay, yeah. I'll buy that. <laughs> so, even if I'm going to try to design almost everything I can myself, the salt shaker is almost all my design. But when there's a tough problem to solve, there are resources to back you up. There are mailing lists that you can join for the open SCAD. And there are people who write what are routinely called uh, libraries or subroutines that you can download for special purpose use. And that's what I did to get the threads. There's a thread library. You just pull the part that you want done as far as how the threads are going to work. I kept it simple because I was really not ready to make a fancy looking 16 threads per inch kind of thing. Though a later experiment using that same library did allow me to produce that. It's a little more fancy. And I will say the threads of the plastic are not perfect. First time you run that wing nut on there, it's going to resist. The first time running that uh, cap onto the salt shaker, there was a small amount of resistance but three times on and off, and it was perfect. Another fairly recent show off is what may, maybe some of you will recognize as a fidget. This one was printed as a piece. And once again, the issue is making the channel a little bigger than the shaft and being ready to deal with the fact that as you go from the shaft to the channel, no matter how small or big that gap is, there's going to be the potential for a little sag in the layer that's in the empty space. So that coming off the <coughs> printer is quite stiff. The plastic, which is PLA, polylactic acid, is very sturdy. Not as sturdy as some of the others, but the PLA allows you enough torque to be able to get that, spin it for a couple of days, and then it becomes loose enough to almost be a good spinner. It's not as good as those that have the bearings in them, but it was mine, and I'm proud of it. Okay, so you've got things that you can make layered. You've got things that you have to stack sideways. Can I, can I ask what orientation you printed this in? Was it like this? 
there's a flat, smooth side there that yeah. was the down. Yeah. And if you look at the wheels, there's a little they also not have quite a perfect spot, spot yeah. because they have to be just so that yeah. the bottom doesn't go through the plate in the design, yeah. but not high enough that they drag in order to make the bottom of the curve. Yeah. So it, it doesn't quite come out of perfect I, circle. I, I, I thought it was kind of obvious which side was the downside yep. on that thing. But, but from a hand feel of it, you're not going to notice it enough to find it yeah. doesn't work as a fidget. Now, my sister-in-law loves hers. And I don't complain. All right, this is the filament that goes into my size printer. There are two common size filaments. One is this nominal three millimeter filament. The other is a 1.75 millimeter filament. And if you buy an inexpensive printer, you'll be getting the 1.75 as the extruder diameter inside the hot part. I'm not sure you can really see it, but that little silvery looking thing with a cone at the bottom is known both as the hot end and the extruder. The hot comes from the fact that there are wires that heat that up. There's a threaded cone which has a little hole in it that produces a 0.2 millimeter thread out of this three millimeter filament. And that 0.2 millimeter thread is what gets laid down one strand at a time, side by side by side until you've done a layer, and then the next layer and the next layer and the next layer. All right, so. That's the process. I will now go to the official slideshow. This, by the way, is not running on my computer alone. This is a web-based presentation using a HTML slide system, which is called S5, simple standards-based slideshow system. It's a great tool if you're looking for something that you can really be about as portable as you want. This file is on the web. I'm pulling it from the web and running it in my browser. It has all sorts of nice little controls. There's my winning prize. And these are some of the things that you're seeing tonight collection of what I've done over the past year. I haven't shown everything to you yet, but I don't know if you want to see all of it. There's a lot here, and I'm happy to pass every single piece around. But maybe you'd like to point to something and say, tell us about that. How'd you do that? What were the problems? Or I'll just stand here and pass these out for a little while so you can get a look at them all. Which would you prefer? I'm curious about the flower, the yellow flower one. This one? Yeah. That is an experiment done doing loops for next, for next, for next. And a little uh, rotatable shape, mm -hmm. which I rotated both horizontally in the sense of going over the top, which would have made a nice dome plus rotating it in the 90 degree side so that it's a double loop. And the wind up was this odd flower. And this, I have not peeled off the hanging chad. That's a political comment. Mm -hmm. I have not removed the political hanging chad. Some of those experiments have worked out very nicely. Others, not so. I didn't really like that particular thing very much. 
but some of these I thought were pretty good. They're all of the same fundamental set. They were made with similar shapes, little modification here and there, and either just a rotation this way with a little growth, or a rotation this way to make something good looking. There's nothing fancy about the code that's involved, and I will be happy to go through my code Anytime. I noticed you dropped one on the floor. Hmm? You dropped one on the floor. Ah, all right. I'd say since it's dropped on the floor, it's time to mention this one. This, in fact, is my most ambitious project. Anybody have an idea what it might be? Flip phone? Flip phone. Hmm? Flip phone? Flip phone. Ah, very good guess. Has holes yes. in it though. Keyboard? That could work. Yeah, I, I was thinking the exact same thing. Fold, folding I'll stuff. I'll pass it around, see if somebody can figure um, out what it is because they played the card game. It's like a cribbage board, actually. That's a cribbage board. First guy gets the prize. What do you know? Oh, okay, yeah, well, we couldn't see it. The, yeah. the holes were a bit difficult to see from yeah. this far away. And the pegs are behind a hidden door that's on the flap when you close it. Mm. There's a fold open door that lets you get at the four pegs that you need to play the cool. game. And they are sized reasonably to come out. That was my most ambitious project because I not only had to do the four next loop to get all the holes to line up, but to figure out how to make the hinges, which turns out to have been a huge effort. You make that as one piece or two? Have a half dozen hinge efforts here that either worked fairly well or didn't open all the way or something other than that. But the idea was that one's one of the hinge tests. Which everything hinges on. Hmm? Tire apps come in handy. Well, it looks looks like you're, you, it's designed for two screws, and I see only one. There, there should be a second screw on that edge too. Uh, probably. I don't remember. That's that's not one of the ones that I gave to anybody. That's one of my uh, home versions. Ah. Uh, I made okay. some effort to give the good ones. <laughs> to the people that would appreciate them. And some effort was appreciated. The previous generation of makers had uh, a run-in with cribbage boards. My great uncle had a tiny little home drill press yep. running with a V-belt to a separate motor. And he made a cribbage board. My grandfather was a present knowing he liked cribbage. But being a man of science, Electrician, uh, he just assumed that cribbage was based on the decimal system, and he made it 50 holes long. I actually doubled the holes on my first one. Tried to cram it all into a smaller space and counted wrong in my loop. That's a perfectly legal board? Hmm? That's a, a full, correct board as far as I can tell. Now, sometimes when you're making an object, you do want it to be solid, but most of the time you want something less than full. There's a piece of software that goes with the printer rather than with the design. It's called a slicer software, and the one I use is known as Cura. Cura is open source, as are most of the slicer programs, because almost all of 3D printing was built on the efforts of makers to design this kind of tool for people so that they could play with it and build their own and put them to use in their maker spaces. Mm -hmm. The group that put this together was known as RepRap. 
that's the kind of reproducible, repeatable thing that they wanted to design. And all the design elements are open. All of them are downloadable. All of them are modifiable. So you can build a tiny printer from the design or a room size printer if you wanted. Everything is possible for the ordinary user. I'm just very curious, was this thing like the bottom half of that mastodon that was in the picture? Yes, <coughs> that's the bottom half. So when I first looked at it, I was thinking it looked more like a bear. Mm. But then I looked up the screen and I saw the mastodon. <laughs> Some people want to call it an elephant, but I have become an uh, active user of the Mastodon system, if you know anything about that mm -hmm. Twitter alternative. Mm -hmm. Recommend it highly. And I know for the purposes of this group that this person, this character, is a worthy member. Some of you probably know well there he was in the background. <laughs> And I've made frogs and puppies and little robin babies. Sometimes I cheat and reuse concepts. The legs on the puppy, for example, aren't all that much different from the legs on the mastodon, though the feet were designed a little bit differently. And occasionally, one of the designs will totally fail. <laughs> I don't want to leave you with the impression that I am the genius designer. That would be inaccurate. So what about Heinlein's flat cats? This is another quiz item. This was a practical solution to a problem in my refrigerator. It's like a good size for a Coke can or a beer can. Yep. In fact, the can in question was a very narrow one. It wasn't one of the nice, sturdy Coke cans. It was like a Caffeine drink, the, oh, the Red drinks? Bull, like that. Oh. That looks kind of big. Tinier. For a Red, Bull. Red Bull's even smaller than that. Yeah. Well, but I needed. Yeah. I've actually replaced this with a big one so that Coke size cans will fit without just perching. But that was a temporary solution because every time we put them on the door, boom, 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 close the door and they fall over. It was an mm -hmm. instant success with my sister-in-law. She thought it was just the greatest. Yeah. Per personally, I think Red Bull nicely made. Stay here. Oh. This is balanced. I'm going to bring this all the way. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's like a plastic Noah's Ark. Any questions about the plastics? They're listed here. I've only used PLA. I hear that polyvinyl chloride is stronger, that nylon is slightly flexible. I'm sure there are purposes. This stuff is strong for the purposes that I need. I'm not building industrial tools. And the PLA is cheap and eco-friendly. <coughs> PLA is actually the plastic <coughs> that's used for internal dissolving stitches when an operation is not going to open you back up to take the stitches that's PLA inside and in those conditions it dissolves over a period of months do you need a different printer for the different materials so they can you need a uh, different temperature for both the bed which is typically heated in order to make the plastic stick while the production is going on, and then 
the extruder has to be hot enough to melt the plastic. So there are limits on what you can actually do. My understanding is that there are new printers available that are industrial scale that will actually squeak, squirt metal so that you can fabricate metal objects by sending them off to a company like Sculptio out there on the web. I heard something a while ago about um, somebody developing a food printer that's supposed to be able to print a pizza that they're going to ship <laughs> up the uh, space station. I would believe it's true because the materials that are in food generally are pureeable and if you pureed the material for a sausage you could squirt it out in the shape of a pepperoni slice. I'm not Cheese I'm is not already very pliable material. Dough? Hey, when you make dough it's almost always wet before you dry it by adding more flour. So it would not at all stretch my imagination to have a multi-extruder tool that would move the various pieces around, set down a layer of bread material, set down a layer of cheese, set down a layer of some kind of uh, red sauce, pepperonis, some more <coughs> cheese, heat it, probably still have to put it in the oven. I don't know whether you make a finished pizza off the extruders. I'm not going to so they uh, mail order a 3D printer that prints pancakes <laughs> and like that, cooks them. Cooks them on the <laughs> spot. Oh, I, I actually saw one of those in a restaurant. Like 200 bucks. Yeah, it, it's got like that conveyor belt. Unbelievable. Like, the stuff on well, the that's and that's that's and that's that's and that's the fellow that came in over here at the beginning was actually more interested in whether I was going to get to medical uh, machinery. It is in progress from what I understand, although I've just read a couple of articles. The ability to extrude material that can become skin is different. An extruder has to be a little more delicate, I'm sure. But the materials, once again, are protoplasm, pureeable, it do it all the time, along with components that could be injected by appropriate extruders that would become the other parts. And I'm sure that people are working on it. Now, this little plastic bag contains the reality of needing to provide support if you're going to print certain odd things. The red piece is a jack and one of the two red pieces still has the support <coughs> filaments built into a matrix to hold the cross arms out. Because if all I did was to try to print without the support, those would just be wasted plastic. It just wouldn't work. Okay. You don't have to use a heated bed with PLA. Uh, uh, you may not have to, if you use ABS, but my experience is it. that if I don't, it doesn't hold on tall, relatively thin objects. If I change the settings, things go wonky. And if you use nylon, you can, uh, there's a thing of verse thing you can download that's a, a pretty nice catapult. <laughs> I can imagine. But, all right. One final <laughs> definite show and tell in here before we go too far. Let me make sure I'm not cheating you out of great slides. I already mentioned Open SCAD. Uh, Blender is designed for other uses that are 3D in movies and other venues, but it can be used apparently to do 3D sculpting for objects. I haven't gotten there yet, but someone said when they saw this captain that my next step must be to get the details better so he doesn't have a round smooth jacket. This 
has also been painted. PLA and I suspect several other plastics are pretty good at taking uh, acrylic paint as a coating. All right. AutoCAD. Did anybody want me to talk about AutoCAD other than to say I don't use it? <laughs> Tinkercad is online, and a lot of people do a lot of this stuff totally online. You don't need to have a printer. It's a heck of a lot more fun, I think, to have your own and explore and experiment and print today what you want tomorrow. But it's okay if you don't have one. The coating. Anybody want to talk about what's involved with a coding project? I can go through bits and pieces. Yeah, so I, I, I've been checking out like the, the Watertown makerspace to have space, and, and I took their 3D printing class. And we used uh, OnShape, the online CAD program. But I didn't, I didn't even think about doing it programmatically. So One of the nice things about programmatic uh, parametric is that you can rapidly restructure by using modules that fit together at different points and if it's not quite right parametrically meaning just change a variable by a tenth of a unit you've got a shrunk piece so that you can set up parts whose size matters based on what you're trying to produce. And when you have made that object, somewhere I have misplaced one thing. It's not stuck it in. Oh, there it is. All right, these two projects are a perfect example of that concept. They are both practical, pointless projects. That's the type I like to make. These were not printed as single pieces. This is a box, this is a box. The top of the box comes off and fits just tightly enough <laughs> that most of the time, the cards don't fall out. It's a card case. And I've just played 52 pickup. Not, but, not 104 pickup? Hmm? Not 104 pickup? Yeah, uh, you caught me. Two decks. Let's pass this around empty. The parameters of that are set up in the program so that if I wanted it to, I could print it twice as tall and put four decks in. If I wanted to, I could make a slight adjustment for each of the dimensions and use bridge size cards instead of the regular card size. The result is that although the insides of this are different, the box is almost the same. It's not the same size and shape, but parametrically it was just a snap because that box was designed so that the lid fit the bottom based on the parameters that had been put into the program. The lid fits on the bottom in this particular case exactly the same way, even though the size was adjusted for the need of what's inside. This is a puzzle known as Dad's Puzzle. Some of you may have seen that somewhere. You slide it around, slide the parts inside around like a 15 puzzle, one of those little keychain things that people get. And that was one of the most enjoyable of my projects because I took a picture from the internet and said, okay, how do I put this together and how do I make it work so that it functions not too tight, not too loose. It 
top when it fits, keeps the parts inside from getting out of position so that someone can start from scratch correctly every time. That was fun, just pure fun to make that. As, even though this was an early project <coughs> and is not very complicated, it's mostly a question of a half sphere and a couple of tubes and a bit of triangulation to make it have a crown on the top of the king and queen's head. That's a simpler project than doing parametric things that way. But Boy, have I had fun. SCAD, solid CAD, that's the format that people don't always publish, which I think is a shame because if you're going to fiddle, you want to be able to work from the original design. The STL, stereolithograph, is the published form most of the time which can be tweaked, but it's a lot harder because the design structure is a layered structure. Instead of being, here's how big it's supposed to be at this part and how big it's supposed to be going up, you can't fiddle with it as well as you'd want. So I think it's unfortunate that most published stuff in STL doesn't come along with the SCAD files. DXF, AutoCAD, anybody that's an AutoCAD fan here? Don't ask me, I don't know anything about it. And the final piece that I use on a routine basis, and where is it? I can drop things over and over and over. I'm good at it. Just to prove, this is Dad's puzzle for going in the car. Yeah. Same thing exactly. Printed out of two different colors, actually, just because it was one of my tests. This one will do. I thought I brought along a flat version of Tux, but apparently I did not. This horse is a polygon extruded vertically just enough to have sides. When you make something, it is various kinds of polygons that you're making. Some of them convert into polyhedrons, which is a more complex 3D version of a multi-point shape. This multi-point shape would be beyond me. So I did that using Inkscape, which I use every day to do other kinds of design issues, and that simply is a conversion from Inkscape format, using somebody else's library again, to SCAD, and then the SCAD code says these are the outside edge points printed. Very nice software makes my life very much easier. So that's there. Once the file gets to the printer, I've described the process, but it is actually a separate piece of software, not open SCAD, but in my case Cura, which came with and is free software again came with the printer by download. The Cura is sold or sold with or given with a whole bunch of different printers. Each printer might have little parameter differences, which nobody complains. This is the lull spot version of Cura. And what it does is to decide how the layers got actually go down and how much of that open square grid is going to be filled. Because there might be a case where you actually wanted a solid, no holds barred piece, 
but you also might want to have a completely hollow sphere for the lightest of ornaments to hang on a tree. And you can set those things in Cura without worrying about the parameters of the original design. So there are two separate sides to that coin. Cura doing similar what? Similar to Slicer then? Yes. Slicer is just another version of the uh, STL interpretation file. STL being designed <coughs> so that you could do a uh, cutout using the router or a plasma cutter and build something in layers using plywood or steel. They are for the same purposes. It's just that we are squeezing plastic out where someone else is cutting. I'm just trying to understand the workflow between the different tools. Right. The workflow is all design in one place for me, all printer control in the other place with the Cura. And the basic beginner settings are what I have used 99% of the time. Only once did I say give me zero infill so that there was no grid work and just built a single sphere to see how strong it was as a single sphere. You can even set the thickness of the sphere shell in Cura. And there are hundreds of other parameters that you can fiddle with speed of the head as it moves across so that you could work a little more precision for a certain group of parts that you were making. Because if you slow it down, the material will adhere better where it's put. The faster you make it go, the more stretching you're going to potentially get and it will sag differently. Every layer that you've looked at here is kind of visible. You can see where each layer went down. And by adjusting Cura's settings, you can minimize that. And then if you're going to finish it fancy ways, you can apply different chemistry on the outside to kind of minimize those ridges. I haven't done any of that yet. So, that, I'm going to pick these cards up before I go. <laughs> Tools. I have found that the blue knife, which came with it, and the little tweezers with the hooked end were not enough to make my life easy. So I have accumulated over the past year the various other tools that make it very easy. When you change filament color to color, you have to pull one reel out while it's hot, put a new color in, advance it just a little bit so you don't have gaps or mixes of color, and this makes it easy to snip off when you're about to put the new reel in. You don't want a funky end on the plastic from the time you pulled it out last. Snapping things off the bed is assisted by doing these pliers. And did I pass the bird around? Mm -hmm. Yes. The bottom of the bird isn't flat intentionally. By reducing the actual surface content, contact, it makes it much, much easier to pull off the layer. There's a coating of material that's, I think, a sheet of some fancy material on a glass plate on these low spot printers. And that material scratches. It's gotten quite scratched in my case. And if I, when I made this first, I almost couldn't get the bird off because the completely flat surface was 
so adhered to the cooled surface that it was just ridiculous. But by removing most of the contact surface and not making the design fail, it was much easier to get the result that I was looking for. File, removing some of the hanging chad, making good measurements, little caliper there, and some sandpaper. That's the same sandpaper that a person working with a wood lathe would use. Um, <coughs> might be able to make it a little easier to remove a part if you, uh, after you print it and it's pulled out, just turn it down for a little bit. That's a possibility too. There are all sorts of tricks and I will gradually take these to heart as I learn them. If we had uh, when I was working at Red Hat, we got an a low spot printer. And Bill Rainford, who arranged it, he, he has one at home. And he, uh, I think we started using a plastic, uh, a plastic thing rather than that metal scraper to get the uh, things off, to prevent scratching the uh, surface. I mentioned that I do uh, a little bit of painting. I have a terribly shaky hand these days, so I'm not good at it. But you saw that the captain has the rope painted and the buttons on his jacket and the beard. Those things were done with acrylic. Acrylic does not shine very well, so I'm next going to find whether um, clear nail polish coat or some other kind of acrylic gloss can make his boots shine because he looks a little bit unfinished the way he is. Would that dissolve the PLA? That might and that's why I'm going to experiment with what I find. I haven't been to the store recently to buy the, uh, there's a material called Liquitex that I mentioned here. I haven't bought that yet. Liquitex is a, man, a manufacturer of artist created acrylic paints. And so you're, they probably have a gloss finish. It's been a while since I've used it. But um, their the colors are, I think, a little glossier than you can use. That's possible, yeah. And it just, yeah I'm, I'm just buying the cheap stuff at this point because none of it's going beyond my family, really, unless it's unpainted. Okay, you have been nice to host me and give me the chance to mumble a bit about my favorite new hobby. So everybody gets one of these. <laughs> this was one of the early projects, but redone. cityscape on the back were components that went beyond the name. Obviously the name was easy to put on, that built-in text as I mentioned. The tux was designed in Inkscape at a much larger size and I thought I brought one of the originals with me but apparently I let it not get in. The Shrinking down did not work to the level that I wanted it to. If you look carefully, the line which appears here in the design doesn't really show. It doesn't cut because the two millimeter, or point two millimeter size of the extruder has a physical distance it has to travel before it goes off and on effectively. So there's a bridge across both these gullies that shouldn't be there. And you can maybe see where the 
foot is supposed to be, but it isn't really there. Yeah, there, there's a little bit of difference in the shininess level. Of work the eyes, and then that gap was big enough for the printer to handle it. And I suspect there are printers with the capacity to deal with finer details. And if I were spending uh, two, three thousand dollars on a printer for an engineering firm, I wouldn't hesitate because I <coughs> needed a thousandth of a millimeter for my precision. This isn't the printer for that work. But for a hobbyist, it's perfect because it's not a kit. And there's the polygon of the cityscape, which I sort of tried to duplicate what's on your logo. I don't think it's perfect. But this was not done with Inkscape. This was done by actually trying to do the dot to dot to dot to dot of the polygon, which was then extruded vertically and removed from the backside the bottom side actually as it printed by doing something known as a difference. And I thought it turned out okay. Mm -hmm. You can disagree because it's your love. Okay. And yeah, if it helps, so we, uh, we actually have the SD, the original SVG file that I created for that logo the, the 20 years ago. At this point, it probably doesn't. Yeah. You know, across the border of necessity, but I should have probably called. Uh, just for the record, should you be in the mood sometime, the camera at my house is pointing towards the printer, and it's very straightforward. Guest and guest. I recommend server push mode unless you're using a mobile phone to look at it. And I don't have any ActiveX on my computer, so that would be a total waste of my time. That may or may not work well. What you're watching is my printer at work this second. It is extruding the third layer of a... Uh, Three soma? My snowmen. That's the most recent real project that I've been doing. These are going to go to one of my relatives for their display for the season. And I will either paint them or let them paint them, depending on how they feel about the process. Mm -hmm. They may say, oh, let me paint my own. And that would be all right with me, too. But this is <coughs> open. During the day, it's easier to see than at night because at night, what we're getting is the infrared view. There's an infrared light on the camera and it's mm -hmm. showing it kind of bland. There's a little better view during the day, but not all that much. Question that I wonder about is, is are the snowmen sort of rocking back and forth? Is that due that's to the a, camera? That's an artifact of the camera. Yeah, that's what I figured. It's a streaming delay issue. Well, no, no more likely uh, it's the, the capturing by the, by the sensor. Is it's a rolling shutter issue. Yeah. yeah. I know nothing about how the internals of the camera work. But it it, it just made this possible. It's optical illusion because the camera's scanning down while the yeah. thing's moving yeah. back and forth. That's a good yep. description. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's, that was my suspicion. <laughs> but it looks hilarious. <laughs> now, I will point yes. out, once again, yeah. there are parts here that had to be designed thoughtfully. That broom that you can see on the back one yeah. is angled. If it were perfectly straight, it would work just fine. The angle makes it have a little bumpy side on the lower side, but that I can file off. The nose, which is supposed to represent a, uh, an orange uh, carrot sticking out from the white colored snow. This is actually white plastic that we're using here. Uh, that nose, if made with the proper droop, 
get snot hanging down from it from the plastic that doesn't quite work. Mm -hmm. But if you make it straight out, there's enough angle on the bottom of the nose that it builds the inside edge and then the next little layer and the next little layer out to the end. As long as it's not too long, I started out with a 10 millimeter nose, went back to a nine, uh, five millimeter nose. Yeah. Results much better. And that's part of the fun of it. You find what you can do, you find what you can't do, you make adjustments that don't damage the image you're trying to make. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, this is once again almost no complex parts. It's three spheres, a cylinder to make a hat, two cylinders actually, one to make the brim, which I couldn't make very wide, again, because without support, which would be hard to provide up there, you're going to get droop below the brim. So the brim is narrow in it. Just a little filing on the back side to make it work out just fine. OK. So that camera is available. I don't know how many simultaneous users you could look in, but the chances are I'm not going to be doing something all day, so you'll poke your head in if you ever do, and say, nothing's going on, forget it. But you might be seeing my next wonderful project, which leads me to say, I should go. If you move, ever move the camera, change the password. Mm -hmm. They say when you move, decide to finally move the camera to something else, change the password. <laughs> depending on what I'm doing. Yes, absolutely. Has it ever showed up on uh, Showdown? No idea. I would suspect so. <laughs> Wouldn't <laughs> surprise me if it's visible by hook and crook. Um, where am I? Oh, wrong place. Periodically, I take the time to write down my notes of what I've been working on. There's the dad's puzzle and the sea captain and our friend Tux. That was an easy project. But boy, did it go over great. It's just <laughs> a flat piece of plastic with a cutout. Fits inside a frame and picture behind it. I did not make a set of checkers because what's the point? They're all exactly <laughs> the same. Uh, but I did go through the fun of trying to get one which would stack. The challenge was worth doing, but making a set was not. Uh, I went to uh, Walmart, the checker set in a plastic case was 10 bucks with a board and a set of checkers and all I did was throw in my chess men and hand off the present with both chess and checkers instead of just the checkers for 10 bucks plus the cost. Oh, I mentioned uh, the filament and all. 24, $25 a reel is the average PLA price for a kilogram. The individual uh, fob, as a, an example, was under 10 cents a piece. They're about three tenths of a meter of film. No, that's not right. I wrote it down someplace in my presentation, but it went by. In any case, should you find any of this stuff interesting beyond today, you can contact me. I'll be happy to tell you from my experience what does work or to take from you what your experience has proved to be useful. And I will be just doing this for years to come, I'm sure. <laughs>
Thank you for having me. Uh, back at the Yeah. I've got another friend that has a Lowe's bar. He set up the printing lab at Red Hat. And um, if you type in, uh, if you Google Bill Rainford Lowe's bar to toys, you'll see some of, his, some of the stuff that he did. He, one of the things he did, he had a rack for pliers, for instance. Mm -hmm. And uh, he also was going to do make lamps. We didn't have lamps installed in our cubes. He was going to make built-in lights for the cubes that we were in. And if you order things like red hat signs and if you're doing stuff that's uh, uh, aesthetic, you can get a much smoother finish after. Basically, an acetone bath. If you want to look that up, mm -hmm. you basically fill a take a little cap, fill it with a little bit of acetone, and you basically tent the part, and it'll go from like a you know a fairly rough texture to like looks like the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. That's great. So if you want to look that up, because I don't usually print uh, cosmetics stuff. I'm, I'm Do you use uh, PLA most of the time or one or the other? Uh, PLA. Yeah. Uh, I've done some ABS stuff. Found the, I, I could do PLA without the heat of the bed, but I, like, I'm, like I said, I'm doing mostly flat pieces. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I started doing the other one and it would just curl right up. So yeah. That one you definitely need to use. I watched a video about a couple of gentlemen who were experimenting with their 3D printer and ran a boat repair service and made a sequence of fairly large propellers using the different plastics. And some of them shredded instantly as they put the boat in the water with the engine cranked up. And I believe it was ABS that did the best under the situation they cruised up and down the lake twice and the propeller came out just fine. Now, I'm sure you wouldn't want to do that if you were at a marina, but if you know, somebody came to you and said, I'm at a loss, the marina's a hundred miles away, I've got to get my boat across the lake before it freezes, conceivably if you had one of these you could build it motor, uh, it, not a motor, but a uh, propeller that would actually work long enough to get the person home. Might, Better than might take less time to row across the lake <laughs> than the lake of print. Yeah. It, I don't know what kind of printer they had, but I got the impression that each print probably took 24 hours. It was a yeah. fairly full-size propeller for a power motor. These prints do take hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This uh, so the with, with digital photography, then the um, old joke about the drugstore photography hobbyist can be reapplied to 3D hobby. Someday my prints will come. No. Uh, Thank you. Uh, you guys are my kind of crowd. Yeah, <laughs> so one, one thing they talked about in that 3D class that I took at the Watertown patch was um, a loft. Like you have to build a 
platform below the thing because everything needs to be suspended, resting on the bottom somehow. Um, mm -hmm. And I know you didn't talk a lot about, you didn't use that term, maybe you call it something else, but like if you're doing something that doesn't have a <laughs> flat bottom, mm -hmm. yeah. like everything, like there's a thing called the loft, which is like a boat term. Yeah. This is the built-in cura process. Okay. That little grid in white was under a card chassis. Oh, I see, and, and I can see that. That broke thing. away fairly easily. It took a little bit of effort to pull it, but the other, the uh, yeah. Yeah. jack, stands on its peg. Yeah. These arms would just have no chance. Right. That is Cura's automatic okay. supply. The trouble is, if I wanted to have something come off at a Y from the top peg, I would need to provide my own points designed probably as a uh, <coughs> two-pointed pin mm -hmm. that I could design to go between a couple of spots on the crossing part so that right. intermediate height lofting or support was possible. I haven't experimented with that, but I have noted that anything above the base, Kira doesn't do a good job of providing support for it because it's too far away. Mm -hmm. Something about the grid design of this support can't go around corners at all. Right. Okay. Kira itself is inadequate to the task. Did everybody? Actually, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, why not instead try doing the jack from printing it from that position where it's sort of three legs touching mm -hmm. the base and then building up? I considered that. The problem is the open SCAD software takes each element from an origin point which means the bottom of the cylinder here, if you rotate it here, and then go at a different angle, you're starting from here. You're not starting from where you think you're starting. That would be a three-dimensional adjustment. I've fiddled with it for a little while, but you'd have to do the X the Y and the Z adjustments to take the points and rock them over to the way a jack actually rests. Had I done that successfully, I would have been able to get what you're talking about because those angles would have been sufficient to support themselves. The problem was I tried it vertical. It worked just fine. I said, okay, I'm not going to bother. Yeah. It was really an expedient issue rather than a get it the best way. If you're doing a lot of uh, like structural stuff that needs support, that's actually one of the advantages or reasons we buy a two filament printer. Yep. The second filament, you will use something that like dissolves easily in water or something like that. So you use that to print your uh, support and the other filament. is a more complicated printer, I'm sure. Yeah, they're not, not a $1,250 printer unless you build it yourself. And I suspect that if you are that kind of maker, <coughs> you could probably spend under $2,000 to build pretty much any printer you wanted if you were good enough with the materials. Because once you have the head figured out, it's just a question of moving it. And if you can move it through a straight line at a good steady speed, you've got a printer. Actually, too. So this big, that's not any big deal. Not just longer to print the big object. To, to a point, really, what you almost need is basically a head that has um, about five, uh, 
you need a two-headed thing that that one head it actually has feed of cyan, magenta, and yellow thread, and basically sort of feeds them in at controlled rates so you can actually <laughs> color. Yep. I'm and sure somebody does you would, that. Prob you would probably want white and black as well, and then and then you need a second head that's the dissolving, destroying medium. Yeah. The, the problem with that is it takes about a foot to for the color to come in to go out. So yeah. you really have to plan ahead. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Well, a really I mean, good job of it, it, mixing it. In, in theory, in theory, it should be possible to do mm -hmm. that. Might be every off. theory and practice are the same. Yes. <laughs> if only that were true, there would be no buggy software. Well, with each color, you're adding adding cost also. Well, I mean, I mean, in theory, if you if you can do full color mixing and I mean, yep. oh, yeah. yeah, and I would think if you looked it up, multicolor uh, extrusion printer, you'd find somebody's working on it, and they have. Yeah. I've only ever seen them used for different layers, though. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, this is white, this is red, this is blue, or black. And, and really, what, you, what for the purpose I was thinking of, really, what you need is basically a combined head that feeds um, multiple strands into it and basically mixes it. And you also need to very carefully control the rate at which you. I would think so. Right. And I think, as you pointed out, the rate that it's going in and the rate that it's coming out. If you know exactly how long that is, then you can basically sort of feed in, figure that, okay, it's going to hit this spot in um, X distance and say, okay, I'm X distance away. I need to change what I'm feeding in. The uh, problem also lies in the quality of the filament. Nominally, it says three millimeters for the filament that I buy. Technically, they say it's 2.85 on average. <laughs> so it's not really a three millimeter, three millimeter filament. Yeah. It's a 2.85, and that difference in an inch of filament would make your color mediocre at best, I would think. You'd need a much more expensive system than I would be willing to build. However, can it be done? Obviously, yes, because they are considering and working and developing tissue printers, as we pointed out, that will become organ printers. I would think be able to print me a new pancreas so my diabetes completely goes away. I would think an easy way to do the color thing would be to uh, print with a transparent filament and then just mix in ink. That might work too. Yeah, that might work too. send your file, your SDLOA, and you get uh, the higher res prints. Mm -hmm. and, uh, when I'm doing some really small gears, or really fine teeth gears, I, I've done that. It ended up costing like 20 bucks for something mm -hmm. a little steep, but they use uh, uh, laser printers, basically. They put out a bed of uh, toner and zap it with a little laser, and they put down another layer of toner and zap it with a little laser, and you're looking at like 1,200-ish DPI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but give it time. The longer t the time goes back, the cheaper yeah, it'll get. They, like I said, they, they basically, I've seen it where the yeah. videos, like they do the windshield wiper of the laser tone. And they you know, rub the laser over it and then do another layer, another layer, and just build it all up. And when it's done, then should yeah. shake it. There are they're kind of, they're, they're different compounds that can be used. Some of them turn into a ceramic, some of them. Yeah, this one will turn into the stuff that I ordered from. No. Plastic could be ceramic, it can even turn into like pot metal. Yeah. They were given, they, you could order from this company, like I could order the gear and like silver, gold, and you know, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, why not? A golden gear. 
flip side is you can wind up with something that makes a you know, lost lab to master. Yeah. And this stuff has a low bumping point at the end. Right, it's 205 Celsius to make a to make PLA <coughs> extrudable. It doesn't actually melt so much as it softens <coughs> to the degree necessary to force through the uh, little extruder nozzle. You can get the wax. Mm -hmm. You can get the wax film if you want to make a, a lost wax. Mm -hmm. One of the articles I read by a guy who does this for real stuff, he said, look, I designed this stuff using my 3D printer, but when I go into production, I use my equivalent machine to make a mold uh, using a, a router kind of cutting, and then I layer in the plastic. I get better results, smoother, and I can make 50 at once because it's real cheap once you've made the first to duplicate the shape into the mold that you're going to use. And that is not even extrusion. I mean, it's not the injected plastic. This is just layered into his mold with no upper surface problem. And there are plenty of those hobby level plastics that you can buy that just mix the two hardener and plastic together, pour them into the mold, swipe the top off so it's level, and then you're done 20 minutes later once it hardens. Yeah, and, and there's gazillions of other materials that can work pretty much that way, so including making butter turkeys for Thanksgiving on the table. process, speaking of the light curing, has been in your mouth for about 25 years. Yep. Dennis has been, been using curable filling material that was UV cured. Stick a little wand in there. And what used to be uh, amalgam, the mercury filled silver, became a kind of ceramic, basically, that was UV cured much safer for your health and equally strong, though not as good for hind teeth from what I understand, because the grinding nature of contact, you're really better off with gold because it <coughs> actually accepts the squashing pressure far better than a ceramic, which will crack when it reaches a certain pressure point. So. All these choppers are fake, and the back ones are gold. The ones where there's less pressure are actually ceramic cram. It's, it's a process, and I'm not going to get my teeth made in my uh, workroom. But yeah, my, my dentist is making his own crowns in the office, not additive process, yeah. but subtractive. Gets a uh, raw ceramic blank that he chucks into this 
um, little digital um, milling machine that has two milling heads that take turns whacking at it uh, with tiny little water sprays pulling them off. Um, and uh, he's done a 3D laser scan of the tooth that was there and the uh, post that's there after he's prepped the post. Yeah. And he then tweaks the splines of the shape a little to adjust the tooth, the new tooth, the way he wants it to look in the 3D CAD program on the monitor over the chair while I'm watching. I was going to say, for that much money did you get to watch? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, 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 and it costs less than sending the work out. Oh, sure, yeah. And, and, and it's a, one fewer appointment because he makes the post and then he goes works on another patient while I go across the hall and watch Right. The two little rotor blades. Are <laughs> you know, it, it looks like the Japanese chef on Saturday Night Live. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of it that is way process, cool. uh, I bought and have not even opened the box just because I'm lazy. A uh, 3D scanner that's designed to work with my cell phone. It's a setup that centers and the motor of this device is supposed to take my camera around in a circle, shuttering every two degrees around it. And with that many photos taken of an object that's on the platform, I should then be able to go into my design software or perhaps even directly into the STL Cura and print the object that I've scanned. Just, it's it's a thing that if you can pull together 12 months <coughs> or even less if you're willing to build your own. Printer bot simple metal is a $600 kit. Yeah. It's a pretty good uh, paper machine. Uh, I just wasn't in that position to feel comfortable building from scratch. And there was another one on Kickstarter. Free. I is also for you don't buy on Kickstarter. Wow, well, I bet. I, I bet on Kickstarter. Yeah. For <laughs> I think it was like 400 or 300 for the kit. But the kit was basically uh, three uh, arms that were basically this, the screw and the uh, beam that held everything in position. You basically had four of these things, you just bolt it down, and you're done. Hmm. The simple bot took me almost 15 hours to put together. And uh, this, uh, this one on the Kickstarter camera, the name of it. I think I put it together. Ooh. Uh, like literally just bop, bop, screw, 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 bop, screw, screw, bop, screw, screw, I'm done. It was just, and then mm. plug in a few wires for the boards. I think that. So, depending on which kit you had, some of them. Mm. I have seen some kits, though, that have been rated pretty poorly by the people who have parent the bot. Yeah, the simple bot printer metal. You open up the bag and you pour out uh, probably about 50 volts. They're mostly in the range of like uh, three to four, maybe millimeters of diameter and then they are varying lengths from 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 24, 26 millimeters long. I'm like, who made this decision? Yeah. <laughs> like, I got four bolts that are 20 millimeters and then I got two bolts that are 22 millimeters. <laughs> Mix those two up, one of them is going to come up short. <laughs> so, once I, the first, once I opened the bag, the first thing I actually did was I got a, uh, like a, tackle box with a whole bunch of little compartments yeah. and separated, measured every single one and separated them out and labeled them. So when the instruction said uh, a three by 18, I got exactly <laughs> that one and not the three by Seven. 20 yeah. and then ended up being short somewhere later. So that, that kit is still in the uh, a lot of work. Hmm. Thank you.
like we have nearly run out of steam. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elgin. You are very welcome. I had a good time, Jerry. Whatever the first Thursday is. Yep. That's my Dennis Cat program. Oh. And he's not the only one doing it, no. obviously. He, so he, 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 he bought it an off the shelf kit. Salesman just brought it in and added this new program to the mm -hmm. screen in the contact room. And I had to upgrade the computer, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and he's got this, you know, tackle box with the different size and um, color mm -hmm. blanks. Yeah. And it then gets tossed in the oven to cure. <laughs> 